Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. Lord, do teach us as we, Lord, open our hearts to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis 49, we're going to start at verse 22 this morning. 22, give a little more background. Genesis 49, 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him, but his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd the stone of Israel. Even by the God of thy father who shall help thee, and by the Almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above and blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breasts and blessings of the womb. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is that, that this is that their father spake unto them and blessed them. And every one, according to his blessing, he blessed them, and he charged them, and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me in the, with my fathers the cave that is in uh, the field of Ephron the Hittite and the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the, from, of Ephron the Hittite for a possession of a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The purchase of the field and of the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. And when the Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet unto the bed, he yielded up the ghost, and was gathered unto his people. Okay, now, in this is the chapter where, where, where Jacob has gathered all his sons together and, and so that he can give them their final blessing. He's going to tell them what's going to happen to them in the last days. Before, And this is the last thing that Jacob is doing before he leaves the world. So Jacob has gone, he's gone through his sons one by one, had a pretty rocky start. Uh, you know, he started off there with uh, Reuben and Simeon and Levi, and that would, should have been enough to make him quit right away, but he kept on going. It got better. And in the middle of this whole blessing period here, in, in verse 18, he pauses in the middle of his blessing, and he says, he breathes out this sigh to God that I've waited for thy salvation, O Lord. Really, we, we, he thought, we thought he was going to die right then and not be able to finish this job of going through all of his sons. He, and he thought he was going to make it, but to his surprise, he keeps on going on. And finally, he's come to his last two sons now, from Rachel to Joseph and Benjamin. And then, and then after that, Jacob will have finished, and then Jacob is going to die. So we've been studying what Jacob has said to Joseph, and we've seen how Jacob has once again, as he's used for all of this chapter here, d relied on symbols and, and uh, uh, um, uh, plants and animals and uh, other things to, to paint a beautiful picture uh, as he has here with Joseph. And in this case, it's a picture of a very fruitful tree. And, and, and we've seen how Jacob first described the secret of, Jacob's, uh, of, of Joseph's fruitfulness in his life, when he said in verse 22 that Jacob, I'm sorry, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well. That was the secret right there. That was the secret of Joseph's perseverance. It was the secret of his fruitfulness in the middle of some very great persecutions that we've already studied about because Joseph had intentionally, uh, had, had intentionally parked his life near to God throughout his life. He parked his life near to God. That's the secret of fruitfulness in the case of Joseph. That's the secret in the case of fruitfulness in our lives as well. It's what the Lord Jesus said in John 15, 5, when he said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abides in me parks his life near me. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So the Lord Jesus, he's our well that, 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 that was referred to by Joseph by the, by the well. He's our well in life. And, and if we, like Joseph, make this decision, 
to intentionally park ourselves by the Lord Jesus, then we're going to be abiding in Christ and we're going to bring forth much fruit and we'll be just like Joseph in verse 22. And then we saw how Joseph's blessings reached far beyond his own family, his own little group there in Canaan. And that picture that Jacob painted was of this fruitful bough that was extending over the wall. And that was the theme. It was over the wall from his domain. And, and just think of the missionaries that, that, that we support just think of them and, and think about how each one of them is like Joseph, how they're each like, they're, they're like fruitful vows that have run over the wall. They run over the wall of their home, over the wall of their church, over the wall of their, 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 their country to foreign fields like Jim and, Jay, Jim and Joy Elliott who ran over the wall to go into the jungles of Indonesia to reach the Marub tribe. Think about Dina and Randy, wild men, who, who, who have been fruitful boughs that have run over the wall into Kano, Nigeria, there to bring the gospel. And, and, and think of the summer blitzers. So you got their report, you get their report this morning, who are now fruitful boughs, and they've run over the wall. And, and to bring the gospel to the Jewish people all throughout the U.S. and Canada and Argentina and Israel. And fruitful boughs that have run over the walls. And that's what God wants us to be. He doesn't want us to be isolated. He doesn't want us to be insulated from the world around us in our comfortable Christian homes, in our comfortable church, in our comfortable circles. But God wants us all to be fruitful boughs that run over the wall and bring the gospel to the lost on the other side of the wall. And, and that's the purpose of the, the, the Israel Alive program is, is, is to enable believers to go over the wall into Israel as fruitful boughs and, 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 and be just like Joseph. And then we saw how Joseph, as a fruitful bough, was running over the wall, and, and he didn't have it easy. It wasn't like, you know, uh, every step with Joseph was like, oh, Joseph, you're fruitful. We're so happy to see you. Not at all. Joseph had a lot of enemies, and not just one enemy, because these enemies were called archer, but not just archer. They were archers, and the archers were shooting at Joseph all along the way, and they weren't just shooting you know, these arrows that were missing, they were shooting arrows that really were hitting and they were hurting him. And it says that in, 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 in verse, 23, verse 23. The archers have sorely grieved him. That hurt. And they shot at him. And they hated him. So Joseph had many enemies that actually hated him. I don't know why they hated him. Though he, he was so, so harmless and non-threatening, but they did. And we saw that Joseph prevailed and he was not overcome by the enemies because they were shooting him at him and Joseph also had a bow as well. And, 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 and his, bow, his, his, his bow was strong, as it says in verse 24, his bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. And now the secret for Joseph to not have been overcome by his enemies were because his arms were made strong by the mighty hand of God of Jacob. And, and, we, and, and it's interesting in verse 24 that it doesn't say that God made Joseph's hands strong, but, but that he made his arms of his hands strong. So God left Joseph's hands alone and, and let Joseph do work with his own hands. And, and, and that's so much a picture of God's help. What God does, does he, God does not take over every part of our lives. He didn't take over every part with Joseph's lives because, because God has crowned us with this crown of the sovereignty of choice, which means that we choose and the Lord helps us with our choice when we're following God's guidance. So with strengthened arms, Joseph was able to use his hands to hold back that string and, 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 and to aim and to fire, and the arrow goes off. And, and, and so in verse 24, Jacob has brought on this theme, and he keeps mentioning this, of the mighty God of Jacob, of the almightiness of God. And Jacob calls, calls God the, 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 the mighty God of Jacob. He's the shepherd. He's the stone of Israel. So Jacob is now speaking from his own experience. And when he's doing this, he's, he's blessing Joseph as, as he says that, look, Joseph, in my life I have found God to be this for me. 
I found him to be a guide like a shepherd. I found him to be a protector like a shepherd. I found him to be rock solid like a stone. And that's where, where, where Jacob is really going now with his blessings on Joseph. He's now speaking to, to, to his son Joseph about his God. And that makes such a difference for a father to speak to his son about his God. And that's what we saw, and that's what we see, rather, King David doing with Solomon in 1 Chronicles 28.9. 1 Chronicles 28.9, where David is having a real heart-to-heart with his son Solomon, and he says, and thou Solomon my son. What? A, it, right away you say something like that. It's not just Solomon, you know. No, Solomon my son. That's the statement of, uh, of, of love and affection and the arm that brings in close, you know, hugs. Solomon my son, and now he's going to give him the most important advice that he can possibly give him in life, which is know thou the God of thy father and serve him with a perfect heart, with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts, understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he'll be found of thee. If thou forsake him, he'll cast thee off forever. That's the best teaching that David could have passed on to his son Solomon when he passed on this firsthand knowledge that, he, that David had in God. And he, and he could, he could and, 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 and then Solomon could turn around and say, you know what dad did? Dad taught me about his God. Well, when David would tell Solomon uh, about God, David could smile because, because David understood God and David knew God. And just like it says in Jeremiah 9.24, Jeremiah 9.24 says, but let him that glorieth, glory in this. You want to really brag, you want not brag, but you want to just feel really great about something, feel really great about this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, righteousness in the earth. For all these things I delight, saith the Lord. So that was it. That was the most valuable wisdom that David passed on to Solomon. Uh, that, and, and when he did that, David just lit up with joy and excitement and he told him about his God. And this is what Jacob is doing now with Joseph in his blessing of his favorite son. He's lighting up with delight. And he's telling Joseph about, as it says in verse 25, the God of thy father. That, that's really something. I mean, you could just see Jacob just saying to his son, you, 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 got, you got a minute? You got an hour? You got a lifetime? I'm going to tell you about the, my God. Well, what Jacob wanted to pass along to Joseph was the instruction that Joseph is in his life should, should, is going gonna, is gonna to need, and of course the descendants of Joseph, and that is to trust in the help of God. You know, the arms, the trust in the, the mighty hand of, of God making strong the arms. Because Jacob knew that if Joseph knew that God would help him, that Jacob knew that, that Joseph was not going to fear man. That's what it means to trust in the help of God. It means to not fear man. That's why it says in Hebrews 13, 6, Hebrews 13, 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So, so, so here's Jacob. He's telling Joseph, rely, trust, put your dependence on the help of God. Because... If you're going to do that, then in the face of all these archers who sorely grieve you, who shoot at you, who hate you, you'll be happy. You'll be happy. And this is what Moses passed on to Israel in, in, the, in his last words to them in Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33, 29. Deuteronomy 33, 29, Moses says, Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord. The shield of thy help. Who is the, who, and who is the sword of thy excellency? Thine enemy shall be found liars unto thee, and, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. So here's this symbol that Moses has used to talk about the help of God, and he calls this the shield of God's help. What a beautiful picture. What a wonderful symbol to visualize God's help. You know, when an arrow or a dart or a sword is coming, 
The protection is the shield. The shield. When we're under attack, up goes the shield of God's help to protect us. Just like a shield is always kept close by. Because you don't know when some surprise attack is going to come. And so God's help is always present for those unexpected attacks. As a matter of fact, David used another illustration to show us about this, about God's protection being always there, because David would watch baby birds. And he watched baby birds, and he saw the baby bird being protected by his mother bird, by the mother bird, and he saw the mother bird use her wings to overshadow the baby bird. And when David saw that, David said, that's it, I got it. That's it. I've got my illustration that I've been looking for to show the constant help of God. And then he wrote to us about it in Psalm 63, 7. Psalm 63, 7, where David said, Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. See, what an illustration he's saying there. Look, just as the baby bird feels so secure and he feels so protected when he's, when he's got that shadow of the wings of his mother, mother bird there, he, David's saying, that's me. I feel so constantly protected. I feel so see, under the help. And, and, and the proof that I really am there is that I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to be a happy person. I'm not going to spend my life complaining about this and that and the other. I'm just going to rejoice. And so when it comes to us having this special protection from God, there is a special, there is a special uh, 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 place where we go to for help when, we're, when, we're in, when we need help. And, and this special place, uh, the Lord, uh, uh, David said in Psalm 124.8, Psalm 124.8, where he said, our help, is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Our special place for the help of God is found in the name of God who made heaven and earth. Now, what's the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth? What is that? That's Jesus, right? Because he, because this is the way John 1 introduces him. In the beginning was the Word. He's called the Word, the means of communication from God. And, 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 uh, and, and the same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Very simple statement. And you wonder, who is that? And then we go down to John 1, 14, 14, and then it says, the word was made flesh. That's Jesus. And then we see that in Colossians 1, 14. Colossians 1, 14, where it says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, He's the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things were created that are, that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. That's the name of Jesus. That's the name of the Lord Jesus who made heaven and earth. That's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where our help comes from. Our help is not in some general uh, general term like God. You know, everybody says God. Everybody gets, the, they, 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 something goes wrong. They go, oh my God, well, which God is that? Who is that? Who is that? How many times have you heard somebody say, somebody have, oh my God, you know. How many times has something happened and you heard somebody say, oh my Jesus. I don't hear that very often. <laughs> right, because and, and yet our help is in oh my Jesus. It's, it's a, our help is in the name of the Lord, the Lord Jesus, who made the heaven and the earth. Now I want you to turn to to, to Isaiah forty one ten. Isaiah forty one ten, very familiar verse. And as you turn to this Isaiah forty one ten, I want you to give me five reasons why we should not be afraid of man. Five reasons from Isaiah forty one ten. Okay. Isaiah 41.10, Isaiah 41.10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So what's the first reason why we should not be afraid? He's with us, right? I am with thee. The first reason that we should not be afraid is because of Emmanuel. God is with us. Okay, what's the second reason? 
He's our God. He's our God. This is not, uh, the, the, he, he, he is not just God. He's our God by the adoption that took place when we received the Lord Jesus Christ. What's the third reason? He's going to strengthen us. It's just so with God, what, what, what Jacob was saying to Joseph. He's going to make us strong. He's going to oh, make, make our arms strong. He's gonna, uh, next one. What's the next one? He's going to help us. And this is really the theme of where we are now with Joseph is he says God is going to help us. And the last one is he's going to hold us up. He's going to hold us up by the right hand of his righteousness. Now, this is something that we have to constantly be reminded of, constantly be challenged to rely and trust in the help of God. And David did this, and he was going, it was like he was going from one group to the other. Now you, and you, and you, in Psalm 115, verse 9 through 11. Psalm 115, verse 9 through 11. This, you can see David going to the first group, and he says, O Israel, big group, O Israel, trust thou in the Lord, for he is their help and their shield. And then you see him narrowing down. O house of Aaron, O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord, for he is their help and their shield. And now he widens out to the whole earth, that is, that ye that fear the Lord, ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Continual reminder, he's your help, he's your shield. Now, now again here, Jacob sets the stage for how it's possible for, for, for God to, to be such a helper to Joseph and to bless him when he uses in verse 25 the word the Almighty. This is the Almighty we're talking about. And, and now Jacob seems to just sort of wave his hands, so to speak, and he's going from the height of heaven to the depths under the earth and then the horizontal. And he starts off in verse 25 where he says, even by the God of thy father who shall help thee and by the almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above. So this is where he starts. Jacob looks up and he asks for, and, he, and he's, he's praying for, he's starting with blessings from heaven above. What are those that blessings from heaven above? Well, it's the sky, it's the sun, it's the moon, it's the rain. And the blessing that, he's, that, 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 that Jacob is giving to Joseph is really one that he received also from his father Isaac in Genesis 27, 28. Genesis 27, 28, when a similar time was happening in the life of his father, and he was, he was on the receiving end, it's, it, it says that Isaac said to him in Genesis 27, 28, therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Now, this is a great blessing that we, we, we don't think about. You know, we, 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 all we, we think about with, with the rain is we go to the weather channel. We said, is it, is it going to be rain, not rain, how much rain, too much rain, not enough, whatever. But, uh, but, but, but Moses set a beautiful picture for us of the rain in, in, in Deuteronomy 28.12. In Deuteronomy 28.12, it says there that, that, that Moses was talking to Israel. He said, the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain upon thy land in this season. What a wonderful description of the rain. The rain is God's good treasure that he gives to the earth. I mean, you know, when was the last time that you stood out in the rain and you, and you, and you, and you looked up and you said, this rain is God's good treasure that he's open to me? See, that's what Deuteronomy 28, 12 is saying. Rain is God's good treasure that's open and is a gift to man. I mean, uh, you know, what, 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 you know, the rain, of course, makes the things grow. And what a difference from, from, from how we view blessings today. You know, at that day, it was just more clear that God was giving the corn and the wine and from the sky and the rain, you know, because they were, they were right there getting it out of the ground there. But, but now, you know, we think it's Costco and smart and final, <laughs> and it clouds the picture. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, how many of you have gardens or fruit trees? Yeah, well, most of you do. Yeah, and, and, I mean, don't you feel kind of closer to God, this connection to God when you, when you go out and you, you, you pick the fruit yourself or you harvest it, you know, from the ground? This is a great Hebrew term. That's used in the blessing, you know, min ha'aretz, you know, fr uh, coming from the dirt, 
the, the land, the dirt, mean the land, coming from the dirt, you know, it, 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 the, the lechem min ha'aretz, the bread that comes from the dirt, the fruit that comes from the dirt. You know, this is a great term because it, it, it brings us back to this connection. This is a gift from God. Well, that's what Jacob was praying to Joseph, that, that he, he would know in his life, this blessings from heaven above, the dew, the rain, make the crops, be fruitful. I mean, I... I, I uh, I, I love nature documentaries on television, but I'm so tired of hearing the announcers steal the glory from God and instead give the glory to evolution working over billions of years. It's just so wearisome to, to have to constantly make these mental corrections in the mind that I'm getting to the point where I'm going to listen, I'm going to watch it with the mute button on or something like that. So the, 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 farther, the farther you and I get from, from seeing God as the giver of the rain and the food that we eat and the water that we drink, the more danger we are in uh, uh, of doing what Moses warned Israel not to do in Deuteronomy 8.11. In Deuteronomy 8.11, Moses told Israel, beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments, his judgments, statutes, which I command thee this day, lest when thou hast eaten and are full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, when thy herds, thy flocks multiply, thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and thou ha and, and, and all that thou hast is multiplied, get the picture, and, and then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, this is like, by the way, from the house of bondage, who led thee through this great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents, scorpions, and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock, the flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, make thee, prove thee, do thee good unto thy latter end. And now say in thine heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. Then thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, that it's he that giveth thee the power to get wealth. So that's that. Now, then, then he goes now to the next where he, he refers to the deep, the blessings from the deep beneath. Now, what's he talking about there? The deep. Well, obviously, he's talking about what's under the He's talking about under the seas, in the seas, in the oceans, under the earth. You know, it's just, it's just amazing to go diving under the water and, and see these incredible creatures. It's like an incredible world of creatures down there. And they're thriving in a fluid that's full of currents going all over the place. I mean, a highlight for me last winter was, was, was when I went down to, to Baja California there to almost the bottom. And you get in these small little boats that only hold about six, eight people, you know. And, 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 and you go out to the Magdalena lagoons there and, and, and the Pago boats, and, and, and you pet humpback whales. <laughs> that was incredible, you know. I still have it on my phone, so I looked at it once. Anyway, those humpback whales are incredible. They're coming from Alaska. They're going all the way down to, to, to either Magdalena Lagoon or, or over in, in uh, Hawaii, and, and they have their, 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 their calves there in the Magdalena Lagoons, and these humpback whales, they're so gentle. They come up, they, they, they want to be pet. I'm, I'm glad they want to be pet because otherwise it could be very disastrous if they had anything else in mind. But they come up there, and those mothers, those, those humpback mothers, they produce incredibly high fat content milk. They produce milk that is 40% fat. Now, just to put it in context, when you go down to the bonds and you buy heavy cream, you're looking at something maybe 36%, 35%, 36%, something like that. 40% fat. And, and, and you think about, well, how much milk do they make? Do they make like a, a quart a day or a half a gallon? No, they make 150 gallons a day. I mean, do you know what that is? That's like three 55-gallon drums. You know, a poor mother says... Boy, I got that done <laughs> today. And then the next day, she makes another 355 gallon drums worth of milk. This is unbelievable. This animal does this. And they don't have nipples and teats and all that. The, so the, the little the baby whale, we saw one, you know, someone was a week old. She, the baby whale comes and, and punches 
the side of her, and this milk spews out, and then because they're filter feeders, and then and then the baby filters. Now that's just incredible. That's just incredible. And and that's that's all covered, and that's just one of the blessings in verse 25 that, that Jacob is blessing Joseph with. Blessings of the deep that lieth under. And then what else? In the ground also. Uh, blessing, what are the ble- blessings of the deep that lieth under? Well, what about these springs of water that come up out of the ground and these streams that come as a result of that. And so he's praying, Jacob is praying that Joseph would know all this in his, in his, in his life. The, bless, the God's blessings of the deep that lieth under. Then he prays in verse 25 that there would be blessings of the breasts and of the womb. Now here, he, what he's saying here is that he's saying, Joseph, I'm praying for you that everything that has a womb and everything that has a breast would be pregnant. All right? Both man and animal have lots of offspring. Blessings of the womb means that there would be no miscarriages. Blessings of the breast would mean there would be plenty, lots of milk, you know, to, to, to feed the newborns. And that's how Jacob prayed for the blessings of, jo- of Joseph's home and of his livestock. Now, now, Moses, he continues with this same sort of vein of blessing that, that, uh, that on the tribe of Joseph, when he very much says many of the same things in Deuteronomy 33, 6, 33, 13. Deuteronomy 33, 13. And when, when, when Moses says, and of Joseph, he said, blessed be the Lord, be the Lord, blessed of the Lord be his land. For the, now, now, now get this, for the precious things of heaven, for the dew, for the deep that coucheth beneath, and for the precious fruits that brought forth by the sun, and for the precious things put forth by the moon, and for the things, the, pre, the chief things of the ancient mountains, and for the precious things of the lasting hills, and for the precious things of the earth, the fullness thereof, the goodwill of him that dwelt in the bush, let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the top of the head that of him that was separated from his brethren. We're going to see that's also going to be a theme that Jacob is going to take up. You notice how many times jo- Moses says the word precious? I mean, five times. The dew and, and, and what's in the deep are precious. The fruits are precious. The, the, uh, and, 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 and what the sun brings out and what the moon brings out. Also is precious. You say, well, what does the moon bring out? Well, I was in Israel when, when, when my friend Avi stopped the car, got out the side. We look at this field, you know, and it looked just like a field of weeds. I didn't know anything. No, he says, no, you see those little, 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 little flowers down there? And they were all closed up during the day. And he said, those, 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 those flowers here in Israel, they close up during the day, and then they open at night, and they grow by the light of the moon. <laughs> That's amazing. Now, well, Moses called the things that grow by the light of the moon precious. And, and, and then he called what's growing on the hills precious and, and, and just the things in the earth. They're precious. Well, that's what the Lord Jesus has made for man, made for us. So many precious things. So many precious things. And all these precious things that, that, that the Lord has done, the Lord Jesus has done, is really kind of over the top for us. It's like it's overtaking us. It's, it's overwhelming us when we think of all these things. I just mentioned the humpback whale, but there's a lot of other amazing animals down there. But anyway, the, and as a matter of fact, the, 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 this out, over, overflowing, it's kind of like God has outdone himself, is really what Moses is bringing out in Deuteronomy 28.2. Deuteronomy 28.2, when Moses says, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. See, that's where God's outdoing himself. And, and, and if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And then he goes through this just litany. He says, blessed shall thou be in the city. Blessed shall thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of the ground and the fruit of the cattle and the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy heap, he, sheep. Blessed be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in. Blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies to, that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessings upon thee in thy storehouses 
in all that thou settest thy hand unto, and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, all those blessings are, are from our God. And all those blessings he wants to give to us, but there's just one qualification, one qualification, and that's in Psalm 8411. Psalm 8411, which says the Lord is a sun and a shield. He'll give grace and glory. And then it says, no good thing will he withhold from them, and here's the qualification, that walk uprightly, that walk uprightly. That means God does withhold good things if a person does not walk uprightly with him. Okay, now Jacob is looking at all these blessings, and you get the impression that he's saying, wow, that's great. That's a lot of blessings. And then he's starting, I mean, he's just giving all this to Joseph. And then he's starting to compare the blessings that he is giving to Joseph with the blessings that he received from his father Isaac and his grandfather Abraham. And with that comparison in mind, Jacob now says in verse 26, verse 26, the blessings of thy father, Joseph, the blessings of your father, yours truly, the blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. So what is he saying there? He says, Joseph, the blessings that you're getting from me are more than the blessings that I got from, from my fathers, from Abraham and from, my, from Isaac and my grandfather Abraham. Now, Jacob <clears throat> is saying that. Now, it's kind of interesting that, you know, here's Joseph and he's, 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 he's hearing his father say, you know, the blessings that you're receiving are more than the blessings that I got. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, not jealous or anything, he's just telling them that. Now, isn't that true for us today? Isn't that true for us today? I mean, in what ways... Can you say that the spiritual blessings that we have today are greater than the blessings that, that, that Joseph received, that the Old Testament receives? And, and I don't mean that we have the iPhone X and they didn't have it. So I don't mean that. So what would you say? What would you say? What are our greater blessings that we have today than the Old Testament saints had? Yeah, we have the whole counsel of God. We've got the whole Bible here. On the, the, that's right, because... The, Moses wrote about this. Okay, good. What else? Okay, well, yeah. All right. What else? We have more promises. All right. What promise do we have that's more than they had? Just general. <laughs> they have more. Okay. All right. What else? Yeah, we have the knowledge, knowledge of not just, okay, let me give you a verse here. It kind of sums it up. Hebrews 1, Hebrews 1, 1, Hebrews 1, 1. God, in the past now, God who in sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past, that'd be like the Old Testament, unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, we have the revelation of the Son. We have the, the fact that the Messiah has come, God the Son has come, and whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory. We get to see the brightness of the glory of God in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the scriptures. And the express image of his persons, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. When did he do that? On the cross. When did that happen? After the Old Testament saints. Sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels and so forth. So that's what we have. And we could say the blessings that we have have prevailed, like Joseph was saying, like Jacob was saying to Joseph, look, your blessings you're getting are more than the blessings I got. The blessings we got are more than the blessings they got. Now, we, 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 we can see this because the Lord Jesus has come. And so that's how it's true from us. Okay. Now, Jacob now calls out how Joseph was separated, separate from his brethren in verse 26. When he says at the end there, it's going to be on, be on the head of Joseph, on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. So Joseph is separate from his brethren. How was he separate through his brethren? Well, obviously, he was separate from his brethren because they sold him. They sold him as a slave. That's how I got separate in, in Genesis 20, 37, 28. 
37, 28, when those Midians, Midianites, merchants, they drew and lifted up Mo Joseph out of the pit, sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. Now, that wasn't Joseph's choice. He didn't want to be separated from his brethren. That was their choice. And in the same way, Jewish believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are separate from their brethren, not by their choice, but by the choice of the Jewish people. And the Lord has a special word to those Jewish believers who believe in the Lord Jesus in Isaiah 66.5. In Isaiah 66.5, this is God speaking to the Jewish believers in the Lord Jesus who have been separated when he says, Isaiah 66.5, Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, which name would that be? Jesus, said, let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy and, shall be, and, and they shall be ashamed. So God's word, that's God's word to them as, as uh, separated Jewish believers in the Lord Jesus. Now, the Jewish believers in the Lord Jesus, they have a special word back to God. So they're going to speak back to God now in Isaiah 63, 16. Isaiah 63, 16, when they say, doubtless thou art our father. Though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not, thou, our Lord, art our Father, our Redeemer, thy name is from everlasting. So that's their word back to God. Okay, now we come to Benjamin. Benjamin. And, um, and maybe Jacob kind of breathed a sigh of relief and thought, oh, finally, the last son, Benjamin. I don't know. But anyway, Benjamin's kind of interesting. Only one verse to describe Benjamin, but boy, is it packed. It says in verse 27, Benjamin shall raven as a wolf, and in the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. So Benjamin is described with the, with, as a wolf, as a wolf. And there are three characteristics that Jacob is describing about the wolf that typifies Benjamin. First, Benjamin shall raven as a wolf in verse 27. Now, the word, the Hebrew word here that Jacob uses for raven is taraf. Taraf, it means to tear apart. Right? It's the picture of the wolf biting into the flesh and the muscles and the organs of its prey and tearing it off piece by piece. That's what it means. Like you see a hawk who's got some rodent or whatever he's got for a prey there, and, he's, and he uses his beak to tear off piece by piece. That's the picture that Jacob is painting of Benjamin here. It's a picture of fierceness and warlikeness of Benjamin. And then next, in the morning he shall devour the prey. The picture that, that he's painted here is he's, he's totally, in the morning, it, 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 it's the word akal. Akal means, in, in Hebrew, totally consuming. He's eating it all. There's nothing left over when he's finished, he's totally consumed. So here the scene is how the wolf is not afraid of another animal coming and taking its prey. This wolf is fearless. He's not like the leopard who goes and makes a kill and then he takes it up the top of a tree so that it won't get taken from him. You know, he doesn't, the wolf doesn't have the cheetah complex where the cheetah kills and something else eats it. No, because he's fearless. So right there in the broad daylight of the morning, the, the wolf is calmly consuming and eating his prey. That shows how Benjamin was not afraid in war, in the fight of war. And then third, in verse 27, at night he shall divide the spoil. This shows how Benjamin hunts at night and surprises his prey and takes his prey and then divides up the portions with his little wolves so they can eat. This shows how Benjamin is skillful in war. So this is what we've seen. He's fierce in war. He's not afraid in war. And he's, he, he's skillful in war. All of these pictures of Benjamin show a warlike tribe in Israel. And, and, that's what that, and that was seen in this time when all of Israel came against Benjamin because they wouldn't deliver up the men who, who, who <clears throat> raped this man's concubine and killed her in the process. And, and so because they wouldn't deliver it up, deliver up those men, then, then all of Israel came against Benjamin. And here's the interesting what happened in, in, in Judges 2015. Judges 2015. The children of Benjamin were numbered at that time out of, out of, out of the cities. 20 and 6,000 men that drew sword. So you've got to kind of keep track. And, and, 
and then there were in, in the inhabitants of Gibeah were numbered 700. So you got 26,000 plus 700. Among all the, and then there were 700 chosen left-handed men, men left-handed. Everyone could sling slings at a hair breadth and not miss. Okay, so 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 that that's on, that's on the side of Benjamin. We about r- more, uh, roughly twenty eight thousand. We got twenty eight thousand men. Now we go to Israel in verse seventeen, Judges twenty seventeen. The men of Israel, beside Benjamin, not including Benjamin, were numbered four hundred thousand men that drew sword. All these were men of war. Right? So the the so so what do we got here? We got twenty eight thousand against four hundred thousand. Those are pretty bad odds, you know, for Benjamin. Those don't look very good. And, and it says in verse 20 there, and the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin, and the men of Israel, uh, and the men of Israel put themselves in array to fight against them at Gibeah. Then it says in verse 21, the children of Benjamin came forth out of ben, uh, out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground of the Israelites that day twenty and two thousand men. They whooped them. There's 28,000 men of Benjamin that fought against 400,000 men of Israel, and Benjamin kills 22,000 men of Israel. And, the, and, and then those 400,000 men of Israel, they, they said, well, maybe it was a bad day. So then they went back the second day against Benjamin, and the results are in Judges 20, 25. Judges 20, 25, Benjamin went forth against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed down to the ground of the children of Israel again 18,000 men. All those men drew the sword. How could 28,000 men go, uh, 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 battle against 400,000 men, 400,000 men and, and, and beat them two days in a row? Because they were Benjamites. Because the Benjamites were warlike. Now, when you think about that, who in the Bible was from the tribe of Benjamin? Paul, Saul, 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 Saul actually. <laughs> the first Saul, the king. And then the second Saul of Tarsus, who was Paul, just so it's confusing for you. Okay, well, who else? Anybody remember anybody else? Was he a Benjamite? Oh, yeah, okay, that's right. Okay, I, I forgot about him. Well, actually, the son of Saul, this is no big revelation, but the son of Saul was also, also from Benjamin, Jonathan, right? And, 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 uh, and anybody remember a man named Ehud? Ehud, yeah, he was from Benjamin. And, and Esther was from Benjamin. Mordecai, Esther, they're from Benjamin. All from the tribe of Benjamin. Well, what about this man, Ehud? Does he look like he's warlike? Well, what did he do? Well, in Judges 3.15, Judges 3.15, it says, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer. Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed. And, and by him, the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of of Moab, Ahad made him a dagger, Ehud made him a dagger, which had two edges, a cubit length, and he girded it under the raiment on his right right thigh. So, you know, he had to do this. Anyway, and, and he brought it, the present unto Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man, and when he made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present, and he himself turned again to the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, keep silence, and all them that stood by went out from he had, Ehud came unto him. He was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he rose out of his seat, and Ehud, Ehud put forth his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade, so that he could not draw out the belly, the belly and dirt came out. Ehud went forth. That's a pretty fierce, ferocious man to be all alone there and 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 and, and knife the the king of uh, that that has rule over you. That was Ehud. That was a Benjamite. And then Saul, Saul, he was also you know it says in First Samuel eleven six. First Samuel eleven six. The spirit of God came upon Saul. And his anger was kindled. He took a yoke of oxen, hewed them in pieces, sent them throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hand of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not after Saul and after Samuel, but it shall be done unto his oxen. And, and then he gets all the people together. There were 300,000 of them. And then, and then uh, 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 <coughs> they went and, and, and killed the Ammonites. That was Saul. Jonathan also, he was a brave man. You remember when he went with his armor bearer? And, 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 and he said, uh, he, he, he said, um, uh, you know, we're going to go out to the Philistines all alone, just the two of us, 
against this garrison, and 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 um, and this is the way it's going to work. He says to his armor bearer, he says, you know, he says we're going to discover ourselves to them, and if they say come up to us, then we're going to know that we're, we we can slaughter them. And so they did that, and and that's what happened, and they slaughtered that garrison there. Fierce Benjamites, and then Esther. You know, we think of oh, beautiful Esther, you know, kind Esther. So nice to be around Esther. Well, in, in Esther 9.13, Esther goes to the king. It should then said, Esther, if it please the king, let it be granted the Jews which are in Shushan to do tomorrow according to the day's decree. And let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. Okay? So, you know, don't name a daughter Esther. Anyway. anyway, and then Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus. You know, it, it, it says in, in Acts 9.1, Acts 9.1, Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. These are all Benjamites. All right, now. Now we come now where he's finished his work in verse 28, and it says, All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is that their father spake unto them, and blessed them, every one according to his blessings, he blessed them. So this is the verse that summarizes the last work of Jacob on earth. This is what he set out to do in the beginning of this chapter when he gathered all of his sons together. And now he's ready to leave the world. He's, and, 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 and how wonderful that there is a verse 28. Kind of wondered what's he going to have it. But, but Jacob, he, he, he could say that he could say the words that the Lord Jesus said to God the Father in John 17, 4. John 17, 4, Jacob could say, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. He could repeat the words of Paul. He could repeat the words of Paul in, at the end of his life in 2 Timothy 4, 7. 2 Timothy 4, 7, when Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. See, verse 28 is, uh, is Jacob. He's now looking back on his life. And, 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 and this is his last work on earth here. And, 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 and he's going to tell, he could essentially say, you know, now that he's blessed his sons, I did it. I finished the work. Now, when we see something like that, it's such a challenge for us to be able to look back on our lives at the end of our lives and be able to say those same sort of things. I did it. You know, be able to say, I finished the work which God gave me to do. I finished my course. You know, no runner finishes a course unless he knows what the course is. He's got to run. You know, every time, I, uh, every time we go to the Del Mar Fair, and, and Scott and I will be going there tomorrow, and, and we, we, we have to cross over to the fun zone, which, which is, you know, inside the track. So we have to cross over the racetrack where the horses run, the Del Mar, Del Mar racetrack. And, and I like to stop in the middle of the track and look down the, whore, look down, look down the course there and just imagine myself a horse. I'm almost as big as a horse. <laughs> And, 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 and running the race, and, 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 and just, you know, I'm just thinking in my, my, my mind as I'm sitting there in the middle, I'm looking down there and saying, well, what, this is what that horse sees when he's running, and, 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 and this is what is in front of him. Now, there's only one way that a horse can finish the course, and, and that is he's got to stay focused on the course. You know, if, if the horse, uh, 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 you know, happens to be on the track and then gets distracted, you know, he doesn't look down the track. He looks off to the side. He gets interested. I wonder what's on the other side of that fence. It stops, and, uh, and can I jump this fence and get over there? He's never going to finish the course. He's gonna, because, because at that point, the race means nothing to the horse. But, 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 but if he's focused on that, that's, that's what's kind of fun to do is to look down that, that course and say, well, you know, i got to get to that part. Then i got to get to that point. Then i got to get to the curve. Then i got to go around, you know. And if he's focused on that, and he's sort of with his eyes and his mind, he's lunging forward, then his feet are going to lunge forward. And if he's a good horse, he'll win the race. But anyway, the greatest danger that we have to not running the race and to finishing the course is that, first of all, in order for us to finish the course and run the race, we have to know what the course is. What's the course? You know, what the course is, and stay focused on the course so that we come to the end of our lives and we can say, I finished the course because I knew what the course was, and I stayed focused on the course. You know, I, I went to the hospital the, the, uh, the day, before yesterday, the day before yesterday and, 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 and to visit the friend who had just been told that she has very aggressive pancreatic cancer that spread to her lungs and liver. And, you know, the, and I was there the night before when, 
the doctor came in and said, I thought it was cancer. And immediately, you know, I said, well, let's not think about that. I said, we're not going to think about that. I said, we're not going to think about that. We're going to think about, you know, how God is caring and God is good. And, he, and he'll, anyway, I was going through all that. Well, anyway, yesterday, we're all there, several of us are there, including Deanna from work. And, and so Deanna says to her, says, so how has your life been? <laughs> I'm trying to keep upbeat, you know. <laughs> I was, I don't want that question, you know, right now. And, and, and that's why I turned to Deanna. I said, Deanna, what are you doing? Are you giving your last rites now? <laughs> you know, it's like, but later, I got to thinking about how that was really a good question to ask. Because it's a sobering look back question. And, and I was trying, you know, here I am trying to keep everybody from thinking about death. But Deanna was being a realist and getting to reflect back on her life. And I was also thinking about when she said that, about how good and how instructive that was for Deanna to ask that question in front of everybody else who didn't have aggressive pancreatic cancer. And it was good for all of us to hear that question. It was good for all of us to realize that, you know, we're coming to a point where, in time when that question will be asked, well, how was your life? Did you finish the work? Did you finish the course? Did you know what the work was? Did you know what the course was? Did you stay focused on it? And, 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 and now here was Jacob in verse 28, where in verses 1 and 2, he'd gathered all of his sons together to do this work, and now in verse 28, he, he, he's finished, and he says, these are them. These are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is that that their father spake unto them, bless them. You know, it's really something. You look at that verse 20, you, you look at that, that, that verse there, in verse 28, when, and when it says that all these are the 12 tribes of Israel. You know, we, you know, we've kind of been reflecting back on each one of their lives a little bit. Well, we have when we read it. Anyway, it says all these are the 12 tribes of Israel. We read that and we say, really? Is this really? Is this, is this really the 12 tribes of Israel? Is, is, this, is, this, is this all the 12 tribes of Israel? This is what God's going to use to reach the world? Yeah, and they're going to turn the world, these people are going to turn the world from darkness to light? This group of men who will become the tribes, that's it? This is the people of God? And the answer is, yes, that's it. And, and, and these are the 12 tribes of Israel. In, a, in our only response, when we look at something like that, is we say, well, if those are the 12 tribes of Israel that God's going to use to bring blessing to every family of the earth, which is what he promised, then all I can say is the words of the chorus, what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. And, 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 and that God could take such a motley crew <laughs> of these 12 sons and turn the world upside down, it speaks of what a mighty God we serve. And, and that's the question for us. When we really look at and take a good look at ourselves and ask the same question, me, me, God's really going to use me to accomplish his will and his work on earth? And the answer is, yes, what a mighty God we serve. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for being the mighty God that we serve. And no wonder, no wonder that angels bow before you and heaven and earth adore you because you're a mighty God. And so, Lord, what we see here with these 12 sons, these 12 tribes, the people of God, it shows us your great and your mightiness with Jacob. Lord, when he was speaking to Joseph, we got the message. In Jesus' name, amen.